welcome to Boxing Bands. Uh, this week, obviously, it's not going to be a video interview because uh, there's going to be an over the phone call with Polly Malinaji, the analyst and former two time world champion. Uh, Polly's been on a couple of times before, and I thought I'd give him a call this week in relation to the Joshua Ruiz fight, but also he's also covering for Showtime the Dennis Hogan fight against Charlo. So I thought it'd be nice to touch on him with that. Now, Polly. As always with the with boxing bands has been very very uh, giving of his time so very nice of him as he was away in Sicily and then obviously with the ultimate boxer heavyweight face offs last week he was in Manchester Friday Saturday flew back to New York Sunday and then basically agreed to take this call first thing Monday morning so uh, very appreciative of, of his time and uh, yeah that's pretty much it so yeah uh, here is Polly Malaji. Hi, right, Polly. Um, first of all, uh, the first question I want to ask you is: um, Are you going to be working with Sky for the uh, Anthony Joshua Ruiz fight in Saudi? No, no, I have the Jamal Charlo fight Saturday, so I'm not, I won't be with Sky. I have to do the the Showtime work Saturday night with uh, Jamal Charlo and uh, Dennis Hogan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously that's that's a big one for uh, for Irish fans, the Dennis Hogan fight uh, and Charlo. And um, did you get happen to get to see the Dennis Hogan fight against uh, Jamie Munguia? Uh, I saw some highlights. I, I, I thought uh, it seemed like he did uh, very well in the fight. You know. Yeah. And uh, seemed like uh, he did himself uh, good. I heard it actually. I heard actually a lot of people thought he won the fight. You know, I didn't get to see the whole fight, but I saw the highlights. I saw he looked good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, Jamie McGee moved up in weight, so this is kind of his opportunity this weight class now won the Charlotte Brothers. Um, how, do you, how do you see the fight going yourself? Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting fight. You know, because Jamal, is the, Jamal is the bigger of the two. You know, he's the one that's that middleweight already, you know. Um, so, uh, I don't know if, if Hogan is intending to stay at middleweight or if he's going to go back down to light middleweight. But um, Charles been looking good. He's been looking strong. So, it, it's a good uh, it's a good barometer to see mm -hmm. for Charles. Because Charles, obviously, being a middleweight at PBC, he's got, he has a hard time finding marquee opponents that weight class because that weight class has uh, a lot of the marquee names over at the zone and with, uh, over with uh, Eddie Hearn. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so for him, uh, uh, Hogan coming off of uh, this performance with Mongolia, with where he was able to, uh, you know, do a lot better than people expected. Um, maybe there's some momentum in, the, in it for him, and it's an opportunity for obviously Hogan to continue with that little bit of momentum. But it's also an opportunity for us to see if Charles was also troubled by by this guy. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, the the fight on Saturday, though. Obviously, are you a little bit disappointed you, you didn't get to go to Saudi? Um, but are you you kind of happy? I know you've been to Saudi a few times already um, since the fight. Um, you know, it would have been interesting to be in Saudi for sure. You know, uh, it's a, such a mega event that uh, you know it would have definitely been interesting to be out there. You know, uh, and I've always, obviously always appreciate this guy for offering me the, the job. Uh, but you know, I'm under contract with Showtime, and mm -hmm. honestly, Showtime. This year, we've have had very little shows. You know, so mm -hmm. anytime we get a show, you know, especially they, they, they'll, they'll expect me to be there. So yeah, yeah I mean, it would have been nice to be there to be a part of such a, a, a part of an event of such a high standard, high magnitude. But you know, <laughs> we can't change it. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, Joshua, got out to Saudi um, about two weeks ago. So two weeks before the fight, um, I'm not sure about Andy Ruiz. I don't know. I think he got there last week. Um, how much of a part do you think that's going to play in the fight itself? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think if they got there, plus plenty of time there. Right? I mean, even if Andy got there last week, I think that's uh, that's fine. You know, I, I do think you'll probably need, you know, especially for always being from the West Coast, U.S. West Coast. There's definitely a major, major difference in time zones, but I think he'll. I'll have had time to adjust by the time you get in the ring, yeah. Yeah. I'll see if you do anything else, you know. What do you think, like, you've been to Saudi a few times and there's been some stuff said, some 
to be honest, a little bit of rubbish being talked about, you know, people's rights, um, women being able to be at the shows and things like that. You've been to Saudi fights and we've seen the Saudi fights between George Groves, Callum Smith. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you think of the culture there? Um, do you think it, the people are overreact- overreacting about it? Um, you know what? I just think I, I just think people tend to overreact in general. I don't I don't necessarily have to agree to, or disagree with the culture in Saudi. I think you know I was treated. I can speak for myself and say I was treated very well down out in Saudi. You know, obviously you're not allowed to drink alcohol. I'm not really an alcohol drinker, but mm. you know there, there was uh, there was plenty to do, and uh, you know I was treated very well, and I can say that I was treated with respect, and I had a enjoyable time when I was there. But as far as the human rights and all the things that that go on. You know, people are kind of funny because the same people that get offended with the human rights situation don't aren't they? They they pick and choose what to, what to get offended by because in reality, you know, I was it's funny. I was watching recently a uh, a YouTube video somebody sent me of Baghdad in 1968, and it was a gorgeous place in 1968. It was amazing, beautiful. Uh, it looked like they had more freedom. I saw women with bikinis in the hotel. So this video lasted about 10, 12 minutes, and it was from YouTube and. It just goes to show you, I've heard the same thing about Iran, because I have friends who are Persian. Uh, in the 60s, it was much more free. Um, so it goes to show you, like, you know, the entrance of the U.S. and the U.K. In, into the Middle East have uh, obviously altered things a lot over there, you know, uh, and caused a, 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 a stern, a stern, a stern, a lot of friction and a stern resistance to the West because of, of the entrance of the U.S. and the U.K. So, you know, I... It's funny that people get offended by things that happen over in the Middle East. Those same people, those same people tend to be the ones living in the UK and the US, but don't get offended by what the, those countries have done to the Middle East and that the, the, the ruination, the, the ruination that they've caused the Middle East. So, so for me, it's more, it's more people are funny at what they choose to get offended by because in reality, yeah. all human beings are not perfect. So if you want to, you can pick both ends of the table and there's something to be offended by on both ends of the table and you if you are the kind of person that will be offended you should probably go live in another country altogether and that should be the first thing you should be offended by is the fact that you live in the uk or the us and you shouldn't because if you're offended by such things as human rights situations you should move out of the us and the uk for what they've done to the middle east <laughs> yeah. i think um i can echo that in terms of uh, in boxing in general Fan, as fans, I feel that like you know, I use Twitter just purely for news in boxing, just to keep updated on things. And it's got stage where so many reporters and that are always looking at the, the, the seem to be moaning and look at the the bad side of Twitter to the point where I've I've deleted my own personal Twitter just because I can't read it anymore. Yeah, yeah, I don't even I don't even uh, control my own account anymore. You know, I I just jumped off it. It's, it's it's, it's such a negative place to be, Twitter. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just totally unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the fight itself, so if we if we really don't get down to the to, to the nitty gritty of the fight in terms of tactically, um, you spoke a lot about in the fight um, about um, Andres's positioning um, all the time, and Ben Davidson made a really good point. He said, you know, Andres is someone who he, he must he has to plant his feet in order to to get his shots off. Can't see as a plan his feet, and he was talking about Anthony Joshua in terms of when he was throwing his jab, he was constantly turning his hip into it. Something that all of us as amateurs would have learned, but at that level, he says that you can't do. Um, would you would you agree with that? Seeing as he's closing the distance every time he's he's throwing his jab and closing the distance for Ruiz. Well, yeah, in some ways, yeah. I mean, I also think um, in the Ruiz, I also agree with Ben that. And he does have to plant every time he throws his shots. That tends to be a quality of a lot of Mexican fighters in that Mexican boxing style. But mm-hmm. especially for big guys, you know, most guys have to close, plant their feet to throw punches, especially at heavyweight because they're so big. Uh, Tyson Fury is, is just uh, an anomaly, you know, where he doesn't have to always do that. Well, most mm-hmm. heavyweights, especially, we do tend to have to do that. And most fighters from Mexico also, when the, the boxing style they teach over there, also tends to be m- mainly plant based on being planted when they fire shots. So, mm-hmm. so I do understand that and notice that, but I also don't think Joshua is going to be the mobile type either. You know, like he may want to box, but I don't think he's going to be fast enough to just consistently mm-hmm. need to be bouncing around like, like a high security either. Yeah. Um, tactically and technically, yeah, the adjustments need to be made. Uh, and now it's definitely one of them that uh, a key thing that Davidson noticed is, uh, you know, th- um, Joshua closing the gap for 
uh, Ruiz himself. He doesn't have to do that, you know. Uh, make Ruiz earn that, earn that distance, and because and, Ruiz, when when Joshua throws his jab in a certain manner like that, Ruiz is able to fight over the top with the right hand. And Ruiz is honestly just looking to throw with you. Uh, he's looking to throw with Joshua. Yeah. He's not even really. He's almost like he's not even countering. He's just waiting for Joshua to shoot, and he just kind of shoots his own hands, you know. Yeah. And if and if Joshua is not cognizant of his distance. Ruiz firing with him will cause him trouble, you know. So he's gonna need more feints and he's gonna need better position tactically. And uh, one of the things he's gotta adjust, yeah, is the way he throws that jab. Mm. Um, another thing Ben Davison said, he said, um, obviously, like like you said, throwing your shots once your feet are planted, your balance is very very important. And a lot of people think that Andy Ruiz is someone who catches the punch and encounters but Ben Davidson said he, he wasn't doing that he was actually meeting the punch halfway and catching it in the air halfway between in the space between them and then countering yeah. um, yeah. is there a way that if that's true so in your opinion how can Anthony Joshua take advantage of that well, first of all, you you, you faint you faint when he's out of position. You know, somebody yeah. somebody's looking to do that when you're throwing. You can faint them out of position. You can you can faint first and then fire out right off that faint. You know, yeah. If you fire out right of faint, you're gonna get a false reaction from Ruiz, and then he's gonna he's, he's gonna have lost his position for that instant. So if you faint and then fire off the faint and instead of just fainting and waiting, which at times you can also do, I think you'll 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 throw some deception into that and and Ruiz will have trouble figuring out the timing of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that, that, that people have always said about Andy Joshua it, it would be his head movement but um, Shane McGuigan it would be uh, Luke Campbell's coach he said that it actually works in his favour against someone like Andy Ruiz who throws uh, combinations he says it's better for him not, to not move his head do, do you agree with that? It depends on the circumstances, you know. If Joshua is hurt, I, th- I think you know uh, catching shots in the gloves, especially at heavyweight, you still feel the impact when you're hurt, you know. So mm-hmm. it's that 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 kind of comes into comes into play, and you and and it hurts you more. As a matter of fact, we saw Joshua not be able to recover once he was hurt because you know everything he's trying to do is is catch shots on the gloves. They're trying to cover up even when big shots are fired, and so. I do think a little bit of head movement and a little bit of slipping is, is key and necessary. But there's also times where, yeah, I agree with Shane, where the positioning is better when he's when he's kind of not moving his head and then he's able to catch a fire. And so that right there is more circumstantial than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the fight itself, like I know a lot of people have said that it's it's essentially a fifty fifty fight, um, but you kind of get. I don't know if you get this narrative from people that it kind of depends on solely what Anthony Joshua does in the fight. Do you? Would you agree with that? Well, it depends on obviously Joshua. But it depends on both guys. I, I tend to be of the opinion that both guys are going to show better in this fight. You know, yeah. uh, I think Joshua will be more mentally and physically ready, and I think Ruiz will also be able to show the different wrinkles to his style because he didn't have to get to show. He didn't have to show a lot of wrinkles in the first fight. He just the first thing he did worked, and that was it. It was over. You know, so. I do think both guys will bring a bit of a bit more flair and fire out of each other, you know, because mentally they're both mentally and physically ready for the difficulty of this fight because now they know how difficult it can be because they've seen each other already once. Mm-hmm. So I, I I think that a, a lot depends on both guys, and I think the way the fight evolves will will be dependent on both guys, not just Joshua. Uh, I suppose I have the benefit here now that you're not going to be working for Sky, so I, I suppose I can get. You to, to I can, suppose I can get you to actually give me your prediction more so and um, but the night of the fight you know um, how do you think the fight's going to go go tactically and what do you think is going to be the result? Um, I don't know. I've, I've heard Ruiz also lost some weight, so I'm not sure how that how that well, is playing out. But he's I he said he's only three pounds lighter than before. That's what he says. Well, whatever it is, yeah. I think I think it comes down to this. I think both guys realize that this fight is more difficult, and I think both guys realize the importance of conditioning in the fight. And I think both guys realize the importance of reaching the late rounds and still having a lot of, and still being able to be dangerous in this fight. You know, so I, I from that perspective, I, I think uh, both guys are making adjustments based on what they saw in the first fight. I, I tend to hedge towards Joshua. You know, I know people suddenly have written Joshua off a lot, and just all of a sudden, Ruiz went from a guy nobody believed in in the first fight. Mm-hmm. To a guy, a lot of people are picking to win even the rematch. You know, uh, I was one of those people that 
although I didn't pick Ruiz in the first fight, I did tell people, I did, I did my best to try to convince people <clears throat> that this guy Ruiz was not just going to show up to lay down. This guy Ruiz is a very difficult opponent, and I have trained alongside Ruiz in the wild card gym about 10 years ago, and I always noticed that he was a quality operator, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, although I didn't pick him in the first fight, I did tend to think that people were underestimating him a lot. And uh, especially uh, when I was working with Sky, the, the team meetings we were having before the show, I was trying to tell guys and don't, nobody was totally paying attention to me, you know? Yeah. So I think I think this time around, though, it's kind of the opposite. I think people are, well, not, I wouldn't say overestimating Ruiz, but now suddenly underestimating Joshua, you know? And I think there is a Joshua that had sort of a chip on his shoulder this fight because he's seen all this, because he saw the way people change towards him and whatnot. And I, I expect Joshua to... Uh, to make the proper adjustments. I expect Joshua to come out with the win, but I expect it in a good fight, in another fight that won't be easy. Mm -hmm. A fight that, that has already been made after this is, is the Deontay Wilder Tyson Fury fight. Um, it's supposed to be penned in for February. Everything's agreed. Um, did you see the Wilder Ortiz fight and what did you think I, of it? I did. I think, I think Wilder is a, a guy who's understanding and mastering his distance very well. Um, but he just has to figure out how to win rounds while doing that, you know, because Ortiz is shorter than him. So he was able to keep him at bay with the left hand. He, went, it, he wasn't always with jabs. It was sometimes with pawing, sometimes with jabs. But I noticed Wilder's positioning is much better this time around than in an Ortiz fight. Mm. Having, said, though, having said that, though, Fury is a different proposition because Fury disrupts your jab because he's taller and he's got a very good jab. Mm. So Wilder, although he didn't, he wasn't super busy with the jab in the Ortiz fight, he was also able to kind of paw his way at distance as well and maintain that proper distance to finally set up, reel him in for that big right hand. Mm. Fury would disrupt that distance consistently with his good jab. And then and, and it can be very frustrating for, for a fighter to try to set that distance up if he's not able to be effective with his own left hand, you know? Mm. So although I think Wilder has a good left hand, uh, I feel like he needs to be more busy with it in the Fury fight because it, in the first fight, Fury clearly out jabbed him and had a better jab, and that prevented Wild from setting his distances the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, majority of the fight, you know. Uh, and I think that's a, I think that's a key, that's a key factor: the, the battle of the left hands. Do, do you like a lot of people have said that you know the two when they fight now, Tyson Fury would be much better, and and hopefully, as you've said, you can notice that. Wilder has been getting better, but do you worry about you know his past interviews when he said he said he won the first four rounds easy? He said commentary was biased. He even said that you were biased um, in regards to his his draw decision against Tyson Fury. Do you wonder that maybe he he won't have made the adjustments or won't have made the improvements once they fight again? Um, you know what? I think I wonder. If he, not that he can make the improvements, but not that if he, if he will or won't make the improvements, but if he can make the improvements, you know? Yeah. Making the improvements, Ortiz, you're taller than him, so you can kind of skate that distance better when he's a taller, more athletic fighter. Um, against Fury, he's the smaller, less athletic fighter. Mm -hmm. You know, Fury's bigger and more athletic, so, you know, whether he will or won't make a will. Well, it won't make the adjustments. I don't know that it even it even depends on him. I don't know if he can make those adjustments. You know, maybe Fury is just better than him. So yeah, that's my curiosity. You know, not just that if, if he knows what adjustments to make. Because I, I'm pretty sure he's got. You know, I I I rate his team. You know, he's well, Deontay's got a smart team. So I think they know the adjustments that need to be made. But can Deontay make the adjustments is, is more the the key. Yeah, the key factor. You know, um, as far as him thinking, I I was biased. Um, you know, I did hear that he said that, uh, you know, I, I influenced the only people that thought Fury won the fight are the people that were influenced by me. But my commentary is only on the U.S. broadcast. My commentary is not on the worldwide broadcast, you know. Mm -hmm. And to tell you the truth, on a foreign on foreign soil, I have yet to meet one person that thought Deontay Wilder won that fight. So those are all the people that shouldn't have heard my commentary, yet none of them think he won the fight. You know, as a matter of fact, the only people that thought he won the fight were probably a few American fans who were probably a little bit biased towards him. So... If anything, my commentary had nothing to do with, with who he thought won the fight because, in reality, they just saw it for themselves. As we see with the foreign broadcasts, mm. uh, I've yet to meet a, a person on foreign soil that thinks Tyson Fury lost that fight. You know, so, mm -hmm. so, so I think uh, 
He's probably, I think Wilder's a good fighter. I think he's a fun fighter. I think he's one of the best fighters in the world today. But to tell you the truth, I, I also think he's probably got too many yes men around him. And they just kind of agree with everything he said. And it's at that point now where, where it's a little bit tough for him to see the reality of certain things. But we'll see, because he is a good fighter. And, and, he, and he, to me, he's probably the number two everywhere in the world. So this fight is between one and two, in my opinion. And uh, it's, we, we have to be very satisfied as fans that we're getting in again. Mm -hmm. Do you think... Um like, if we're playing devil's advocate here, do you think that if Andy Ruiz beats um, Anthony Joshua, they will some way force themselves out of the Fury fight and try? Al Heyman will try to get the Wilder to fight Ruiz um, straight away? Do you think that would be possible? Um, I think it would be a real shame if that happened. That would be a real shame if that happened, you know, because whether whether Waldo can or can't be Ruiz, it would be a real shame because I think that Fury and and Waldo would be a, a is a fight everybody wants to see. Number one, mm. um, and number two, I also think Ruiz and Konatsky is a fight to make. You know, uh, Ruiz and Konatsky to me is a is a tremendous tremendous heavyweight fight yeah. between two people who don't look the part, but certainly all of the part. And they're all a lot of fun to watch, you know. So I think Ruiz and Konatsky should be made even with if Ruiz loses to the fight to Joshua. But mm -hmm. if you make Ruiz and Konatsky for the heavyweight title, it, means it becomes even more amazing. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, it's also a very difficult situation because as soon as that fight's over, to, uh, apparently two mandatories are going to be slapped on on the IBF and the WBO. So yeah. it, might, it might come to a point where one of them's going to have to be um, given up. Um, yeah. Which, which could... Yeah. Which could lead Usyk to have a, a shot against a WO vacant WO. Uh, it's true. Belt. Um, right. Well, I think that's that's really it, Polly. Um, so we'll catch you on Showtime this weekend, and then next week you're going to be in Manchester for the Ultimate Boxer. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll be there. And Absolutely. I. And that's your last uh, bit of work before Christmas. Am I right, or is there another show just before? No. Mm -hmm. Done before Christmas and then Javante Davis after Christmas. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Right, well, um, thanks once again, Paul, for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, and I'd also like to say I hope you really enjoy uh, the holidays this year. Thanks, mate. You too. You too. Enjoy. Okay. okay.